Coming up right now on Lifestyle Magazine, could a second career make the years ahead the best years ever? You'll meet some people who have made the leap and are loving every minute of it. And now the hosts of Lifestyle Magazine, Dan Matthews and Mike Tucker. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. We are talking today about retirement. We're talking about second careers and all that that entails. Now, Dan, you're supposed to be retired, aren't you? Well, after a fashion, I'm supposed to be retired. And uh, I will just say simply, Mike, that this is the best time of my life. Come on. No question. <laughs> because I, except when I come to do a production like this, there's a producer somewhere that yells at me. Yes. But other than that, <laughs> everything is going just wonderful. Just great, huh? And I get to do things with my wife. We go mm -hmm. together. We have opportunities for additional activities. You talk about second careers. I think we've got third and fourth careers mm -hmm. going. And it's uh, wonderful to be able to do things that we want to do when we want to do them. We can say yes or we can say no. So for anyone who may be dreading retirement, mm -hmm. I would just like to say it is the best time of your life if you just anticipate making it the best time of your life. You know, my mom has found the same thing. She is supposed to be, quote, retired now, and she's got a second, third career, but she's also volunteering. And so we're going to take some time to talk to my mom. Joining us today from Arlington, Texas, is my mom, Arlene Tucker. Hi, Mom. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Mike. So give us a quick overview of what a typical week of your life looks like so we can get an idea of how you manage to fit in all of your volunteer activities. Oh, um... I still have some hangover from one of my careers. I'm doing some marketing part-time, uh, but I usually reserve afternoons on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays to um, work at the church, in the church office, actually. That's great. Do you mind if I ask how old you are? Actually, I kind of I welcome that when people ask me. I don't want you to think I'm in my 80s, and I'm only 77. There are obviously a lot of opportunities for seniors who are willing to volunteer. So how do you decide which ones are right for you, Mom? It's a very individual thing. Um, you might think that I would volunteer in health care since I worked in health care most of my life. But I wanted to go where the need was greatest right now. And I want to be of service to other people. And I decided that uh, working at the church office was a good place for me. All right, how long do you plan to keep all of this up? Well, if my health holds up, I see no reason why I can't do it for another 10 or 15 years. Thanks for joining us today, Mom. You're welcome. Joining us now is Jim Emmerman, Executive Vice President of Civic Ventures. Welcome, Jim. Glad to have you with us. Thanks so much for being here. So, Tell us about Civic Ventures. What is Civic Ventures? What does it do? Well, it's an organization. We're in San Francisco, also Washington and Boston. And we basically promote the idea that our society has a huge amount to gain from the engagement of people who would have been considering themselves in retirement, but in fact are creating a new stage of life for themselves and a new stage of work in which they can use their talent and experience to solve and address some of the problems that are most important to them, most important to their community and to our nation. You know, Jim, I like the reference that I read in some of your material about the second half of life. Yeah. It has the, the idea that it's as valuable and can be as productive and is as exciting as is the first half of life. Mm -hmm. And I, I hear that coming through in what you're saying about Civic Ventures. Right. Um, we do believe that. Um, people work for 50 years growing up, developing their first career, sending their kids off to college, uh, building their resume, and then have the freedom to really use all of that experience for the things that maybe they've wanted to do all their life, whether that's be a teacher, work in healthcare, mm -hmm. work for some nonprofit organization, but really work that matters to them. It might be as a volunteer, it might be as a paid, uh, you know, as a paid second career. Is it, is it often true for people who are in the second half of life that they even go for another education, another preparation for a second job? 
One of the things that we're seeing is an increase in people going back to school to be trained to do that kind of thing. Um, often people have experiences that doesn't that don't need retraining uh, you know translates really well to work that is so important to our community mm. but um, there's a huge number of people who are going back. I think the ministry is an area where we're seeing mm -hmm. lots of people in their 50s mm -hmm. going back because they see, you know, the need to give back in some way. Um, the school Divinity schools are filled hmm. with people who are yeah. in their 50s and older. So it is something, is that, so what's causing all this? What, why are people doing this? Well, I, I think there are a couple of things that are happening really. One of them is that we have this huge extension of life that we never had before. <laughs> And the idea that's been sold to us of retirement, you know, spending the rest of our days on a golf course <laughs> might have had some value if it ever really did have relevance to people at a time when they weren't talking about a 20 or 30 year or 40 year retirement. Mm. Now, for a variety of reasons, that's just really not going to satisfy people. They want to stay engaged. Right. Do the uh, regulations, the laws, government uh, uh, provisions and so forth, is is it contributing to the second half of life or or how do we cooperate there? Well, there's a lot that could be done to improve that, um, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, the way that we treat older people in relationship to, the, to work and to engagement is the same way that our country treats farmers. We pay them not to do it. That's incredible. And we incentivize people to retire from work rather than finding ways right. to support them, to give them the freedom to work in work that matters. There's a lot more to talk about here. So we're going to ask you to please stay with us because there's much more of Lifestyle Magazine right after this break. I learn English, you can also, on Hello Channel. Well, why don't you just say hello? Joining us now is Rick Kocher, the enthusiastic founder and director of Stand Up For Kids, and Mike Gambrell, a staff member of Stand Up For Kids. We, we want to welcome both of you guys here. Thank you Thanks. for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Dan, for having us. So what is Stand Up For Kids? Stand Up For Kids is a nationwide organization that goes to the streets, all volunteers in 37 cities, 20 states, that goes to the streets and helps homeless and street children. And what do you do to help kids that maybe don't want help? Wow. I, you know, Dan, I, they all want help. Most, but they don't know it. Well, I think they do know it. They don't, they're too young. When you're under the age of 18, you're, there's no way to get off the streets without tremendous help. So uh -huh. they don't see a way off the streets. For the most part, they're not going back home. And for the most part, they're not going back to foster care. So a life on the streets is what they believe is, is the way they have to live. Hmm. And how do you help them? What do you do for them? Well, immediately with us, we carry backpacks full of food and clothes and hygiene products. But we also have all the data in every city. We do a tremendous survey to find out what resources are available to kids. And we tell them, here's where the shelters are, the centers are, the clinics are. We help hmm. them get ID cards and birth certificates, teach them how to wow. drive, how to shop, Good how to run. cook, how to furnish a part. I mean, life skills. It, everything. Yeah. I think all too often people look at homelessness as being homeless and for kids on the streets, you know, if it was someone my age, mm -hmm. you know, an mm. old retired guy, if right. I was, I've had a life and now I'm homeless. But for right. children, no family, no church, no yeah. community, no school, no neighbors. It isn't homeless. It's lifeless. And you have to help them put this back together first. Mike, uh, you're with the organization. Am I risking to ask if you were ever one of those on the street? Yes, I was for six and a half years, um, from the time I was 15 till I was 21. So. And you saw some way of giving back here then? Yes, most definitely. Uh -huh. So what do you do? I um, personally, I work with the Don't Run Away program, which um, oh. is a deterrent for kids to keep them off the streets. Um, and the fact that in event that they're being abused, that there's somebody out there that they can trust and can tell. Um, that the streets are not the answers, and it's not a place for them to look to to feel safe. Hmm. Now, again, you told us that you were on the streets for quite a while. Yes. Again, can I be so bold as to ask, why were you there? Well, um, 
I was uh, kicked out of the house uh, at the age of 15. 15? Yeah, my mother was a single parent. Um, we didn't necessarily get along completely, and uh, she felt that she had done all she could, apparently, and that was the last resort, apparently. Hmm. And so she turned me away, and I ended up hitchhiking from El Paso, Texas, to San Diego, California. San Diego. How, how were you prompted to start Stand Up For Kids, Rick? Well, that's a great question. Um, I was, like I said, I was in, I'd spent 30 years in the Navy, and I knew when I retired I was going to volunteer. Mm. Uh, I didn't know I was going to start a program for homeless and street mm. kids, but I had my own command in Denver, Colorado, and I got orders to go to San Diego. And before I went, I saw an article on the 48 Hours News Magazine about this woman who helped homeless kids in San Diego. And I said, well, when I get there, I want to help her. <laughs> and eight days after I got there, I tracked her down, and I started volunteering, and I thought, no, kids need much more than this. And I left and started Stand Up For Kids. Hmm. How did you first attract kids? By looking for them, by going to the streets, the gutters, the sewers, the riverbeds, abandoned buildings, yeah. cemeteries, everywhere. I mean, kids, homeless history kids hang out in unbelievable, unsafe places. Are these kids glad to have you come look for them, though? Uh, I think at first, Dan, they're really afraid that we're going to send them home or we're going to get them locked up. You know, but when you go down, when you go to them and you sit on, if they're sitting on the ground, you sit on the ground and you start talking to them and you say, hi, my name is Rick. You know, no, because at first they, nobody else does that. It's yeah, like, right. and, and so of course they're leery. And, and, but they, over time, and other kids will tell other kids about our program. Mm -hmm. It takes some time to gain their trust, and of course that's what we want to do. We want to gain their trust. We want to be there for the long run. It isn't about, here's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, uh, you're talking about second half of life and people who are looking for ways of, of personal fulfillment and also giving to society. Uh, is this the kind of thing that you find a lot of people responding to wanting to help with? Well, well, Rick is an example of thousands of people that have come to the attention of Civic Ventures through a program that we call the Purpose Prize, which is really focusing on social innovators and social entrepreneurs ov over the age of 60 who have created these kinds of incredible programs. But in a way, what I would say is that Rick um, is maybe an extreme example. <laughs> you can tell from his enthusiasm that he's got, you know, incredible energy and, and, and time to put into this, but also incredible creativity and inventiveness in, in what he saw as the problem and how he went about solving it. And I think there are thousands of people like that, but there are tens of thousands of people <sighs> who have skills that can support a program like Rick's. Right. You know, maybe they would do the books for him. You know, maybe they would be, you know, outreach people working on the street. Maybe they would man the phones. Maybe they would, you know, help him um, fundraise or write a strategic plan for his organization. There are people with all sorts of talents. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're not going to start an organization right. and run it for, you know, the number of years that Rick has run Stand Up for Kids, but they have a tremendous amount of talent to bring to it. And I would say those people number probably in the millions, really. That, that is an incredible story. What, what really grabs me, though, is that, all right, you, you've got a career in the Navy. Tell me about this bridge, Navy to, to, to taking care of kids. Why? How? Uh, well, I, I had three children of my own, and I have seven grandchildren. In fact, my grandson is a trainer in this program who mm -hmm. trains all volunteers. Uh, it, I, I don't know that there was a bridge that was a need, and uh, I saw the homeless kids in San Diego, you know, and you can't get upset about things you're not willing to, to do something mm -hmm. about, and I just thought I could, I could do something about this. And, and maybe it's because I didn't have, I, had I known better, I probably would not have done it. <laughs> it's been a rough 17 years. Is that uh, right? Well, the kids at first, certainly, uh, and then volunteers come and go, and then mm -hmm. sponsors come and go, and, and it's, mm -hmm. it's you, you have to be the one with a smile on your face all the time and yeah. keeping it going. You know, uh, Mike, you used an operative word for me a little bit earlier when you described Rick here as young. <laughs> and, and it seems that that is some entree to the kids on the street. What did you mean when you said young? Uh, he's, he's a machine. He's nonstop. He, he's, like, he's literally like a 10-year-old kid trapped in a senior's body. <laughs> he, he's, he's, he never it's stops. It's more than 10. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 12. <laughs> but he just never stops. He's, he's, he's 
eat, sleeps, breathes, stand up for kids. I mean, that's, that's, oh, that's, that's, that's he's devoted to. That is, that is wonderful. And it is obvious that you're getting a lot out of this. And it's obvious that you've appreciated it and valued it. Yes. Well, we want you to stay tuned because we've got a lot more coming up. So stay tuned right here with Lifestyle Magazine. And we'll be right back after this. <laughs> Thanks for watching Hello Channel. Learn the language of the internet, travel, commerce, and diplomacy. Watch Hello Channel and learn English. Do it for yourself. For some people, there is no such thing as an unsolvable problem. They always seem to find a solution. And June Simmons is one of those people. Welcome to the program, June. Thank you. You are with an organization known as Partners in Care. Tell us about that organization. Uh, Partners in Care was uh, founded to address the problems in our health care system these days. There are so many uninsured. Uh, we built a system for a totally different population, a shorter mm -hmm. lifespan, mm -hmm. uh, short-term problems, and now 80% of what we do is around chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're very focused on what happens in the community, families who carry the long-term burden of care, and we're working to reshape health care. Did your first career inspire you in this direction? It did. I worked in a hospital. Uh, helping people leave the hospital, and I saw people end up in nursing homes or go home vulnerable. I saw people who should have never been sick or injured in the first place, and so uh, I got very interested in prevention and broader choice for people at home. Well, that is exciting. This has got to bring you a tremendous amount of satisfaction. Very, very wonderful work it is indeed. So what do you get out of this? Why did you go to the second mile, the third mile, so to speak, and start this organization? It's just very exciting to be able to take on something that seems like it's not working, where America spends a fortune on large numbers of people with very poor results. Mm -hmm. Let's take end-of-life care. Twenty-five percent of the Medicare dollar is spent in the last year of life. Yeah. And yet there's terrible suffering. People aren't dying where they want to be. They're not able to make use of that time, which can be very rich, beneficial time for families. And so uh, we worked with Kaiser Permanente to uh, find ways for people to be cared for at home, mm -hmm. have physician visits, have a number to call who knew where they were so they didn't have to go to the emergency room. And our research team was able to prove that this was not only much better care that everyone liked, the families, the patients, the professionals, mm -hmm. to also drop the cost of care so those dollars could go for other things. They changed their national benefit. That was like a victory beyond anything we yeah. could have dreamed for. That, that's like touching 14 million lives with a small but fine you team. Helped, you helped create that change with the organization. We did. We brought resources to them that uh -huh. allowed them to test this idea and, and show that it had merit. That, that is incredible. I mean, to get an insurance company to do anything. It's, well, Kaiser's it, dedicated to the Well, right that's good. Thing. That's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I hear you saying, June, is you, you are changing a social paradigm of, of our culture. As you said at the outset, our health care uh, industry is set up for a certain kind of person or population, and we are not them anymore. That's right. So you, you've got this one wonderful model with Kaiser Permanente. How is that uh, changing across the board, though? Are, are others participating? Well, that's part of the work we're doing now that we've established that that model works. We're taking it out, so now we're working with Presbyterian Intercommunity Hospital. Okay. Huntington Hospital is doing things. Places all around America are trying to change the way that they address end-of-life care, and this uh, proven model helps contribute to mm -hmm. that. It's not the only model, but it's, it's a powerful one. Now, are there, are there associated organizations with yours across the country? Is yours the first one, or how do, how do you relate with other organizations? 
Well, we participate in many associations, but uh, we're kind of a hybrid. You don't hear mm. about many not-for-profits yeah. that yeah. were formed like this mm -hmm. as a boundary spanner. We kind of have mud on our boots. We, we know <laughs> what it's like to be a health care mm -hmm. system, and we know what it's like to be uh, able to measure results, and we bring those two together mm -hmm. uh, in a unique way. So that's, that's original, but we partner with many. Now, I, I couldn't help but pick up on the mud on your boots yeah. <laughs> idea there because the gentleman sitting beside you, he knows about mud he on does. his boots too. <laughs> he does. Uh, and, and you're both a, a affiliated in some fashion with Jim Emmerman's organization, Civic Ventures. And mm -hmm. uh, what, do, what does that do for you, Rick? Uh, well, I think it brings like-minded people together. Uh, I remember last year when we all got together for the first time and they were asking us, what did this, what was this like? And I said, this is the first time I've been together with 70 some people in the same room and nobody asked me why I did what I did. Huh. That's amazing. amazing. It is. Yeah, it was, it was just, I mean, it was, one, it was unbelievable because people typically say, why? Yeah. They, well, let me ask you something. You guys, you've got a million wonderful stories about these kids on the street. Could you share one of them with us right now? Sure. Um, I'll tell you a story about Brian. And um, Brian was one of our kids for about five years, just like Mike, a little over five years. And, and he helped us with some training, -y, training. And Brian and I were being interviewed by a newspaper reporter in San Diego. And I didn't hear the question she asked Brian, but what he said, I'll remember forever. He said, um, I can remember nights in my squat. And if you don't know, a squat is a place where kids sleep or adults sleep, but it's just a place where they sleep. He said, I can remember nights in my squat when I would be rolled up in a ball and I had my thumb in my mouth and I would be crying and I could hear other kids crying and I was praying that I would go to sleep and not wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, how did we ever get here, you know? Man. Rick, thank you for what you do. Thanks. June, thank you for what you do as well. Both of you are making a real difference with a second career, and we appreciate it. Thank you. And we'll be right back with our guest in just a minute. My name is Alan, and you're watching Hello Channel. So it's obvious that there's still a lot of work to be done by anyone else who would like to volunteer or have a second career. Right. A big thank you to all of our guests, June Simmons, Rick Kocha, Mike Gambrell, and Jim Immerman, and to you, Dan, and for you for watching. For more information about Civic Ventures, Stand Up For Kids, and Partners In Care, visit our website at lifestyle.org. And I'll see you again right here next time on Lifestyle Magazine. Until then, live well and be well.